Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Handicap Hustle with Jim Breslow, your host, and Richard Frazier, your handicapper extraordinaire who has <laughs> launched into the NFL season at a 67% clip, winning two out of three games this past weekend. Uh, all of you were able to see them if you went on to Substack, Phrase Wins, and you saw that the picks were released in advance. So this is no magical voodoo going on here. Rich went two out of three last weekend, and he's got three more picks coming up this weekend. So we're going to walk through those picks from this last weekend, talk about some of the highlights from the first NFL weekend, what kind of trends that we're seeing, uh, things that betters are going to be watching, some things that were surprises, et cetera. Uh, pretty exciting NFL weekend for an opening weekend and a great opening weekend for Phrase Wins. Welcome back, Richard Frazier. Thank you, Jim. This is going to be a lot easier show to do, my friend, than had you gone one and two. That would have been a <laughs> that, that would have been a totally different opening, and things did not start off too well for you. What I what's fun about this show, in my mind, is being able to go through the season with a real professional football handicapper and and it being open and raw because we have no idea how the season is going to go. We know that virtually every year uh, that he's been doing this the past 20 years, he's had uh, successful seasons, but uh, you're, you're getting to see how the sausage is made here and see how he's choosing, making these picks and then seeing each week how he's doing because most handicappers out there uh, are not as open as, as rich. And we, we were texting each other over the weekend and I made the comment that for most football handicappers, it's 95% marketing and 5% the actual picks. It's all how these guys market it and pretend that, you know, my best bets were five and one, but they ignore the fact that their strongest bets were 0 and four or whatever. They, they manipulate this stuff in a way, and it's all about marketing. And, um, you know, it, the marketing part is important, but it really should be 95% the picks and 5% the marketing. That's what phrase wins is all about. And uh, when we give you numbers, you can trust this is what he did because those picks were on the board. You could still go to Substack and see how the picks did. Uh, but you also saw that he had a rough morning, at least out here on the West Coast, where we get to watch the games at 10 a.m. You guys on the East Coast have to wait till till 1. That's kind of a fun conversation at some point, by the way, because I, I sometimes wonder which one I prefer. I grew up with the the East Coast times. I think you did too, Rich. Uh, yes. But but I, I appreciate getting started at at 10 in fact and then when i'm in hawaii uh even better when they they start i think at seven <laughs> in the morning a little, a little early for me but yeah yeah so uh so walk us through you know it's your first weekend you're probably nervous like all the players and coaches were nervous and rich gets nervous too and his his first pick was the carolina panthers and they didn't do too well uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, your first pick, the Carolina Panthers, why you, why you chose them and, and, uh, that result. Well, obviously, first of all, remind us who they were playing. I don't even remember who they were playing. Uh, the, uh, the Carolina Panthers were playing the new Orleans saints. Uh, they, uh, I gave it out at plus four on Thursday when I re or Friday, when I released it. Uh, it did move down to plus three and a half at the, at the close. Um, so the money, but, the money was going on Carolina. Just, yeah. So, so, so you liked Carolina and, and the betters liked Carolina. Yeah. Now, it, you know, I, there was a time where that was the norm. When I gave out a play, I would expect the, the numbers to move along with me because I was very influential. Uh, at one time uh it, it, at this uh time I, I i don't think that it was me necessarily moving the line as much as it was that that, that other people like carolina as well well what uh, about what about this let, let me just tag on to that for a second you, you know do you the broad public you think like in carolina or the methodology that you use to pick these, you know, and I know there's a lot of algorithms, et cetera. It is true that there are other handicappers that use similar methods that may have seen similar things, right? Well, that, that that's true. Um, you know, whose money outweighs the other. It, it's hard to say, like, if you, if you go and look at uh, betting splits, like I, I can look at, uh, 
Vegas betting splits, and, and they'll they'll differ widely from DraftKings betting splits. You know, it's it's, it's funny because DraftKings being the you know, the second biggest sports book operator in the United States, their their betting splits may completely differ from Vegas betting splits. And I, I always find that interesting. Splits meaning how the bets break down, how much money's on one side versus the other. Correct. And 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 bottom line, that pretty much is the only reason that Vegas would move a line, right? That their split is off. Is there any other reason they would move a line? Uh, not unless there was, uh, some last second injury or change of player personnel, that would be mm -hmm. the only reason, but generally so it, it's money. And, and generally it's safe to assume if a line moves like that from four to three and a half, not a huge move, but a move that means more money was going on Carolina, which means that Vegas probably made money on that game, right? Cause Carolina did not cover. Uh, that that's correct. I mean, the books. Again, the books make line moves. They don't like to move lines because they they set themselves up to to lose more money if the final score ends like right on one of those two numbers that they, that they were on, whether it be uh, you know the difference between three and four. Um, but uh, they they generally move the the number to uh, attract a little more money to the other side because their goal their ultimate goal is to be fifty fifty on these games in terms of money. So Carolina ended up getting smoked. What was the final score? Uh, Forty seven ten something like okay. that. So what's what's going on as Rich? Let's get in Richard Frazier's head as he's watching this game, and it's his yeah, first, well, pick, his first pick of the year, and and his team's getting killed. <laughs> let's let's climb in my mind. I, I'll tell you exactly. Uh, you know, I uh, I yeah, I did feel a little anxiety coming into the weekend because uh, I I know how important it is uh, to get off to a good start. First impressions mean a lot, so. Uh, I obviously want to come out the, the gates uh, winning. And so, you know, the first game at 10 o'clock, I, I, I know at this point that all my players are locked into all three games. So I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, in, a, in a panic. Uh, uh, was I disappointed that Carolina wasn't even in the game? Yeah, it, it, it disappoints me. But uh uh, I knew that I had two more to go, and I, I feel confident. And, and, again, I've been through this so many times that uh, that, that I know that, that over the long haul, the numbers are going to fall my direction. You know? And is there any explanation for what happened to, to Carolina, why, why they didn't perform as you expected? Well, I can tell you what I saw in, in the game. Uh, they, they, they didn't seem to, you know, all the play, all, all the things that I, that I seen that they have upgraded, you know, in terms of bringing the quarterback whisper, uh, revamping the offensive line, bringing in more uh, receiver targets. They didn't seem to matter. Uh, they they still made uh, their share of mistakes, the interceptions and uh, turnovers and uh, just basically doing everything wrong that they could do wrong. They weren't picking up any first downs uh, to give their defense a break. Their defense just wore out and uh, and it seemed everything the the Saints did or that couldn't they, that the Saints couldn't do last year, they were able to do yesterday. So now I promise we're going to get to the two winners that you had, and they were very nice, uh, easy winners for you uh, in a second. But just to finish up on, on Carolina, because I'm, I'm trying to help people understand your methodology, even though they were a total embarrassment, everybody's, you know, already predicting an 0-17 season kind, kind of thing. You picked them and, and lost on them. That doesn't mean, however, that they couldn't theoretically be your pick you, that you you might not pick them again next weekend, correct? That's absolutely true. I mean, what we see in a in a in a mismatch, uh, just always remember that that the team that lost is not as bad as they appeared to be in that game. Uh, consequently, the team that won is not as good as they appeared in in that blowout. So. Right. Um, you have to remember that now, you know, I, you've asked me before about like, you know, 
man, doesn't it uh, like feel bad that, that, you know, it didn't even come close, you know, um, shouldn't there be something built in there? That, well, you know, there's, there's basically, you know, four metrics here that, that, that factor into my algorithm uh, on the, the, the favored side, the team either wins the game and covers the game. Now, uh, in terms of my rating system, they get points for that. If the favorite wins the game but does not cover the game, then I don't reward that team for that outcome. Okay? On the underdog side of things, if a team uh, covers a game but loses the outcome of the game, I don't penalize them for that. But if they lose the game and lose the spread as well, then I do hold that against them and penalize them for it. Mm -hmm. So those now, are the four metrics that I use. Now, of course, this was week one. So were you using those metrics from last season? Uh, last season, plus a few other seasons, I have to have a, a sample size that's large enough to mean something. And then, of course, obviously, you got to look at coaching personnel changes, player personnel changes, because if in a crazy hypothetical, literally all players left and it was all new players, you'd have to pretty much toss out last season. Yeah. And uh, but a lot of that is is automatically done for me based on how they uh, the books come out with the lines themselves, uh, because the lines are built on the book's own algorithms in terms of power rankings of a team. You take one team's power ranking and another team's power ranking and you subtract the difference, add in the home field advantage and boom, you have an opening line, you know? So. Yeah. Your, your, your plays are, are more about public perception that there's a perception that such and such team is, is, is X good. And oftentimes they're not as good or they're better than people think they are. Yes. Right. Then they're, they're the yeah. perception of the team and, and those perceptions yeah. can carry over to the next season. Everybody assumes because Kansas city won the super bowl, that they're going to be good again this year. Uh, albeit in the first game, it, it seems like the players were the betters were kind of going Baltimore thinking there'd be a little super bowl hangover, but, but broadly speaking, everybody's assuming KC will have a great year because they were great last year. That's true. Um, although when we, uh, talked about that game off camera i did tell you i well i talked about we talked about it on the show last week I yeah said, we, we could be talking about you being yeah. four and one over the weekend uh on the show if anybody was watching last week's show you did give out a, a little strong lean pick to kansas city and then you gave me another uh lean pick to was it philly that you gave me yeah on friday night the, the brazil friday game night. Yeah, so I'm, I, I'm 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 sitting here fat and happy with my four and one. Uh, thanks for these uh, <laughs> wins. All right, let's move on to the other two games and just talk about them briefly because there's some other things I want to cover. But um, two nice, relatively easy wins for you, uh, starting with Chargers over the Raiders. Uh, yeah, as uh, as bad as that Panther loss was, I, I can say that the two winners I had in the uh, late round of games weren't weren't much of a sweat uh, either. So uh, that kind of balanced out. But uh, yeah, um, I, I expected the Chargers to come out and play a solid game. I, I know that uh, Raider Nation, there's a lot of hype surrounding them and they they like their, their new former interim head coach, Antonio Pierce, who's now the official head coach. And but uh, and and when they matched up last year, the the Raiders put a whooping on the Chargers that was one of Chargers' ugliest losses ever. Um, they put up fifty two points on the Chargers, something like that. <clears throat> but uh, I I think the the Raiders have major problems uh, in in terms of their offense. They they still have a pretty solid defense, but. You know, you, you got this uh, second-year quarterback in Aiden O'Connell who battled all camp along with Gard Gardner Minshew, uh, who, again, I don't think is a franchise quarterback. And, uh, and you know, the running back, Josh Jacobs, is gone. So, 
I, I think they're they're going to have offensive problems all year long. They're, they're going to have to play a style similar to my Pittsburgh Steelers, where you you just hope the defense plays strong enough to give your offense a shot. You know. All right. The Steelers then, are one of the, the only teams I could know that could win a game with uh, five or six field goals. <clears throat> then uh, the 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 Cowboys game. Uh, they were they went to Cleveland, right? And they were underdogs at Cleveland yet. Beat them pretty they, they, they were underdogs. Uh, let me point out that 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 Charger game, uh, the number didn't move. It it stayed at three because you know again, books don't like to come off of hard key numbers like that. But even in the uh, the Dallas game, uh, when I gave it out, uh, it was plus two and a half, and uh, uh, a lot of a lot of the books by kickoff had Cleveland only favored by one on that game so that would have been a game that the books lost on the money was going on dallas they kept moving the line and ultimately the betters were right on that one uh and the cowboys won by by how much uh cowboy i don't uh i don't have a final score on it let me see here uh cowboys won that game It was 33-17. Yeah. That'll tell you how what an easy game it was for. You don't even know what the final score. You you, you went to bed at halftime of that game, relaxed probably. Yeah, I, I, I did. I started dozing off the second half. <laughs> so, uh, all right, that does it for the picks. I, I wanted to cover a few things um, about the games because we had talked about some of the rule changes and, and the kickoffs. The kickoff, to me, is just seems to be a total disaster. Um I, I didn't really focus on it that much. I I, I scroll I, I fast forwarded through a lot of games that I watched and so on. I, I usually fast forwarded through the kickoff. But aren't I correct that nine out of ten everybody's just kicking it into the end zone? And wasn't the whole point of this to to have there be more returns? Um, you know, I I, I noticed a lot more touchbacks yesterday than I did in the preseason, where it seemed like the the kickers were were like trying more to you know put that ball inside the five and and have the guy return it but you know again when i when i measure the starting field position i i really don't see much of a difference so well well let's walk through this i'm just interested in in the rule change in general and then i know you're focused on how it maybe impacts you know, the outcome of the games. So it makes sense that in preseason, the teams are trying this out and they're going to see, Hey, how does this work with us trying to drop it in there? Can we pin the team back, you know, inside the 20 yard line or at least inside the 30, which is now where they just give them the ball. If you kick it into the end zone. So based on your observation in the preseason, how were they doing? Did the teams seem to be able to pin the teams usually uh, uh, behind the 30 at least? I, I can't say that to be fact. Um, it, it, it just, it, it all seems the same to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't, I don't see any difference at all in, in starting field position. I, I, uh, I mean, I, 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 I don't see kickers wanting to give teams the ball at the 30. I, I think that the idea still is to keep that ball inside the five yard line and give your, uh, your special teams a chance to, to pin them short of the 25, you know? Well, I don't um, know. Then, then maybe the kickers were just out kicking it. Maybe they were trying to put it there and they weren't successful, but most of the kicks I saw were just going into the end zone, touch back, take it to the 30, same boring problem as we had last time. Well, and there now- was a lot of lot of rookie kickers kicking yesterday as well. There was a lot of missed field goals uh, is, uh, in those games going on too. So, I mean, yeah, I, you know, again, I, I, this is just a, an injury thing. I don't see it being uh, consequential either way, um, other than well, you know, I, to me, it's consequential just in that. You know, it's the NFL. It's the it, it, it's a brand. It's been around for a long time. You don't try out crazy new rules every season just to kind of see how they go. The kickoff in football is iconic because it's the beginning of the game. So so even though the kickoff has gotten kind of boring, it's it is it's the kickoff, and they've totally changed how the kickoff looks. You've got this 
red zone that they're trying to kick it into now. The players are standing over here. They're not moving. It's like, what the heck's going on? And then after all that, it just keeps going in the end zone and being taken up yeah. to 30. I think, which... uh, but I, I think there's been a lot of pressure from the NFL PA, the Players Association, about uh, head injuries. And a lot of your injuries are coming on these kickoff plays when you have these players running the, the full right. length. But we've been talking about head injuries now for almost 20 years. The high level I would make is you're the NFL, okay, big brand. You don't just roll out something brand new without trying it. You run it in a couple preseasons first and see how it goes, and then you ha then you decide whether to roll it out. To roll out something this substantial of a change willy-nilly just to see how it goes in the regular season, and it will be in the playoffs and in the Super Bowl without even having tested it in a few preseasons, I think is really stupid. Well, yeah, I, I I will say that the the league seems to have a lot of power now. When they want to implement a change, they do it. It's it's instantaneous. You know, they uh, they you know, and I don't see why unless it's something that the NFL PA is going to strongly disagree with. But there's no reason for them to disagree with this. Yeah. Well, and let's um, talk about a rule change that everyone has wanted for a long time that came up this weekend a couple of times that the NFL still sits on their hands about, which makes no sense to me. Maybe you can explain it. And that is the overtime rule. College has figured out a very nice, very even handed overtime. Both team gets the ball at 25 and has a chance to score. The NFL has a situation where it used to be you, if you won the coin toss, all you had to do was go down and kick a field goal or a touchdown game over. Other, other side doesn't even see, see the ball. They realize that's not really good. So we changed it. Now it can't just be a, a field goal. It has to be a touchdown. But last uh, Sunday night, we have the situation where Detroit wins the coin toss and the way those offenses were going by the end of that game, you pretty much knew whoever won the coin toss was going to win that game. March down, score, touchdown, game over. Rams don't even see the ball. Stupid, totally unsatisfying result. NFL's had this problem for a long time and it just continues. Um, yeah, based on the two teams that were playing and the way they were moving the ball. Now, I, I will tell you this, that in, in game one, I noticed that that a lot of these defenses were down at the end of the game. Uh, conditioning, uh, a lot of places, the weather's still pretty warm. Um, but the fact is, they're just not used to being on the field for that many plays. But yeah, oh, those that, Ram, yeah, those that Ram defense was just a mess in that overtime drive by Detroit. They were just pushing them around, running the ball straight up the middle. <laughs> yeah, five Montgomery yards, ten yards a clip. Yeah, so it it watching that game, it's easy to to say that yeah, that that rule is certainly unfair because you have a defense that's that's, that's totally worn out and uh, and yeah, I mean the way both teams were moving the ball, it seemed like whoever won that coin flip was going to drive down and score a touchdown. Well, and when you have such an obvious alternative staring you in the face, as long as it has. Everyone I know who's a football fan loves the college overtime and hates the NFL overtime. Yeah, I uh, I can see the the NFL possibly moving to to that type of of overtime because it it, it seems to be a bit more fair. Uh, if you have a couple more games this season that go the way last night's game went, where you know one team gets the the, the ball and drives down, all the way down the field, scores a touchdown and kills it, then uh, you're going to have a lot of people crying foul that hey, you know we didn't even get our chance. So I, I could see the NFL possibly making another change to their uh, their overtime. So from a betting standpoint, overtime games are always interesting to me. Usually I have the underdog and it goes into overtime. I'm thinking, hold on a second. The score is tied. I had this team plus three. This should be game over. I just won the game by three points. Yeah. I said, I got to go into overtime and I got to win in overtime. Now it worked for me the other way last night because I had Detroit and I got very lucky. You know, I had uh, D Detroit giving up points 
And at the end of regulation, I should have lost the game based on having given up five points or whatever I gave up. Uh, right. That was, a, that was a lucky win for you, Jim. That was a, I will be the I was, first I to acknowledge. Of you, I was thinking of you when I watched that game. I said, you know what? When, when Detroit won the corn flip, I said, Jim's going to win his bet. Would you lay four and a half on that game? I said, because yep. they're not going to go down and kick a field goal. Not the way these defenses are playing. They're going to put it in the end zone and win it. Right. Well, covering a spread that's more than three in overtime is especially tricky because, you know, you pretty much have to win the coin toss and go down and score a touchdown because otherwise they're almost always decided by a field goal. Uh, but, yeah, that was a backdoor cover, as they, as I like to call them. But I was owed that because I've, I'm usually on the other side of that uh, situation. But um, I don't know. I guess, you know, all, all games are always based upon the final score. Uh, I guess there are soccer games, actually, a lot of times that th th they'll have the the bet based on regulation. And I think that maybe the NHL does that, too, sometimes uh, where, where it's you're betting on regulation time only. But I've never seen that bet. Semi interesting point. I've never seen that bet when it comes to college football or NFL. No. Uh, yeah. S soccer games. Um, I've, I've had a lot of people that try to get me into uh soccer betting but uh my, my problem is that i i can't get any hard data on on soccer results uh so it, it makes it extremely difficult and there's a, a a million teams and a million different leagues out there and uh so i figure i i got my hands full with my american my my, my american uh, sports here that i that we already have but no, uh, uh, hockey uh, doesn't work that way. Um, ho hockey doesn't have regulation bets, uh, the NHL. Um, if you have a team to win and they win it in overtime or they win it in a shootout, that's a winner. So mm, I think I've seen it more as maybe a prop bet. I think I've seen it uh, perhaps in like the playoffs or something. I don't know. You're, you're the hockey guy. I should defer to you uh, on that. But but yeah, they definitely have it um, in soccer. Well, we'd be remiss if we wrapped up the show without talking about the biggest game of the weekend. And that's wherever Taylor Swift is, is the biggest game. So that happened on Thursday night, which was a great uh, game. Uh, and, and I had to chastise Rich because – I was recording the game as many people do. And most people know that now that you got to can't assume that your buddy watched the game live with you. So Rich sends me this text messages that says, that says great game. And I hadn't seen it yet. And I knew, I knew Rich had taken KC. So I'm like, okay, if Rich is saying great game, that means he won. So, I, so now I know KC won. And for him to say great game, it must've been a one score game. Uh, but nonetheless, we, 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 we already had it out over that, you know, Rich isn't going to do that again, but it, 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 it was a, still an exciting game, even for me knowing that information. And the one comment I was going to make about it is, is the replay rules because 20 years ago or however many years ago, that game would have that touchdown at the end where the guy's toe was a centimeter out of bounds. It was ruled a touchdown, right? That was overturned. So it was, sure. ruled a, it was ruled a touchdown heading to overtime or to Baltimore going for two. Uh, and, and instead, because of the replay, it was game over. So I applaud the replay on that play, even though in general I hate replays because I just feel like thanks to replays, the games are taking longer. They've had to shorten them. And now we see there's fewer real plays and more replays. And I don't want to see a replay of third down – of whether he made the first down at the 42 yard line going head first across the line and whether he made it by two inches or missed it by two inches. I don't want to see that replayed 10 times. You're talking about an actual scoring play. Yes. Scoring plays should be reviewed. I'm not sure there's anything else that should, should be reviewed. Maybe a couple of other things, but I, I'm still annoyed by, by the impact that replay has had on slowing down NFL game. Hey, I, I agree with that. It it, uh, it it busts the flow of the game. People want to see the action. Now, yeah, I, and I to wholeheartedly agree with you that on scoring plays, yes, we, we have to get that right. But, uh, but you know, it, it's the efficiency of the replay process as well. I mean, Jesus, they, they go out and they, they hire these ex-officials now to, you know, 
comment on, you know, what they think uh, happened here. And, you know, they make a big issue of it. And half the time they're wrong anyway. So. Uh, yeah, no, you make a great point. You're 100% right about efficiency. Why, why, again, this is the NFL. You guys got plenty of money. There ought to be somebody who's sitting in a booth and has got 15 TVs surrounding them in, in 3D who is watching it and immediately with each play that's happening, anything that they see that's incorrect, they can wire down, correct it right there. You don't need a challenge. This is what I love about what they've done in most tennis. If anybody was just watching the U.S. Open, the players don't have to challenge anymore. There's there's no everything is instantly called automatically by the Cyclops machine that is determining whether the ball is in or not out. It's a fake voice that's calling it out if it's out and it has sped up the game and there is zero replays in tennis. And you could effectively have that in football. Don't have challenges. Have a guy that's watching and if they just screwed up a call the guy was out of bounds and he was called inbounds hey he was inbounds okay inbounds and the well, play is fixed, the if, play is you fixed. At, if you look at all the different sports out there and and the uh the, the rules for challenging you know i mean so what if in football you challenge something you're just taking a shot you lose a timeout you know at least like in the nhl if you want to challenge a play uh, you know, whether it was offsides or the puck didn't completely cross the goal line and you're wrong, then you got to go shorthanded for two minutes. You know, it makes yeah. people think twice about challenge. So don't make it. I, so I, easy that or my idea is you get rid of challenges altogether. There is somebody watching in the sky. And if something was called wrong, they correct it, period. That's it. No why, challenges. In baseball, why in baseball do we now put up the pitch box so we can show how wrong the umpire is? Why don't we just go to an automated AI ball strike system? I'm all for that, even though I'm a baseball traditionalist. But, you know, when there's easy uses of uh, technology to improve games and improve speed, then implement them. The one in tennis is the best example of it's made the game way better. I think that would make the game of baseball better and uh so, you know, getting rid of challenges and making it just quickly automated, I think, is the way to go. All right. I think we're just about out of time, Rich. So let's talk about what we got up coming this weekend. We're going to have three more picks that you're going to post. Uh, we gave them free on Substack, phrasewins.com, F-R-A-Z, wins.com. is That's your website, I guess. Do you have a yeah, website? The, uh, yeah, the, 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 the picks are actually on Handicap Hustle Substack. So, Okay, sorry. That's right. I made that mistake last time. So go to Handicap Hustle is the sub stack. Handicap Hustle, the same as the name of the show. Go to Handicap Hustle. You'll see the picks from last weekend. You'll see how he went two out of three. He really went four, uh, four, out, of five, four out of five, if you include the other two picks. Um, and check out his picks for this week. But this time, you will have to pay. But uh, he's got a first month special going. So it's just $79.99. You'll see the pricing on there. Uh, for the first month, and that would give you a four weeks of picks and uh, a lot of winners. So uh, Rich is hard at work at picking your next three games. You'll be putting them up on Substack on, uh, what, Friday or Saturday? Yeah, generally uh, this week I put them up Friday. I, I, I have to look at when I when I feel that the – if and when a line is going to move. I told you initially on last show that I would – have them uh, up by by Saturday, no later than Saturday. But based on where the money and the lines were sitting, I decided that I could release them on Friday. So uh, it, that's going to vary from week to week. So, All right, everybody. Go check out Handicap Hustle on Substack. Thank you, Richard Frazier, for joining the program. As always, I'm Jim Bressel. Thank you all for watching and listening. We'll be back next week, every Tuesday, with Handicap Hustle to talk about how – Praise wins did the past weekend. Take care. Thank you.